Hello, my name is Kelly. Thanks for opening up my talk. This presentation is titled Carl von Frisch and the Discipline of Ethology. The goal of this presentation is to solve a long-standing mystery about the history of ethology. In 1973, the discipline of ethology came into its own when three of its most prominent practitioners, Conrad Lorenz, Nicholas Tinbergen, and Carl von Frisch, jointly received the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Historians have shown how Lorenz and Tinbergen were central to the practical and theoretical innovations that came to define ethology as a distinct form of animal behavior research in the 20th century. Von Frisch is rarely mentioned in such histories, and when he is, he's often framed as an expert practitioner of ethology. But von Frisch was 17 years older than Lorenz and 21 years older than Tinbergen. By the time Tinbergen and Lorenz began promoting ethology in the 1930s, von Frisch had already developed his own experimental approach to animals and established himself as a prominent academic. Furthermore, von Frisch never seems to have used the term ethology to refer to his own work. However, or how can we resolve this tension between the pervasive sense that von Frisch was somehow integral to the discipline of ethology on the one hand, and historians' inability to articulate a clear relationship between von Frisch and ethology on the other hand? In short, what is von Frisch's relationship to the discipline of ethology? If the role of early adopter or expert practitioner doesn't suit him, the most obvious alternative is that von Frisch was a co-founder of ethology, alongside Tinbergen and Lorenz. But that answer also seems to be ruled out. As historian of ethology Richard Burkhart writes, von Frisch essentially took no direct part in the efforts that constituted ethology as a new discipline in the middle decades of the 20th century. To begin unraveling this riddle, I'll explore the idea that von Frisch was an exemplar for the nascent discipline of ethology. I'm using Andrea Woody's notion of a scientific exemplar. She writes, exemplars display without explicitly articulating what a scientific community judges to be explanatory, what model of intelligibility it has chosen to embrace. An exemplar is an example that through community sanction, we are urged to follow. It has action guiding force. By questioning whether von Frisch was an exemplar for classical ethology, this paper uncovers previously neglected affinities between von Frisch's experimental approach to animals and the program of early ethology. In the 1930s and 40s, Tinbergen and Lorenz were eager to frame ethology as a discipline that reconciled certain reductionist and holist commitments. On the one hand, they promoted reductive, causal, physiological explanations of behavior over psychological explanations. On the other hand, they saw animals as complex collections of interdependent parts whose behaviors bore nuanced relationships to environmental context and phylogenetic history. And they were keen to incorporate an awareness of those relationships into behavioral studies. But these abstract ideals underdetermined the concrete practices that achieved them. There's more than one way to reconcile holist and reductionist strategies in animal behavior research. In what follows, I'm going to demonstrate how the experimental approach von Frisch developed during the beginning of his career between 1909 and 1914 embodied the reconciliation of holism and reductionism that Tinbergen and Lorenz promoted decades later. To do that, I'm gonna compare the experimental practices of von Frisch with those of his contemporaries who sought to answer the same question with the same animals at the same time. Those questions were, can fish see colors? Can honeybees see colors? Here's Carl von Frisch around that time. He just finished his doctorate in zoology in 1909 at the University of Vienna and was working as a research assistant at Munich Zoological Laboratory. Around this time, von Frisch invented the gray card technique for testing animal color vision. I'll start with his experiments on fish. To test if fish can see colors, von Frisch hung a row of color test tubes from a wire. All the test tubes are grayscale except for one tube that's colored. Before lowering the tubes into the tank, von Frisch puts food in the colored tube. The fish eat the food from the colored tube. He changes the position of the tubes because if the animals can see colors, von Frisch wants them to form an association between the colored tube and the food, not between the position of the tube and food. He does this kind of training for days. Then for the experiment, he doesn't put food in any tube. If the fish can see colors and have formed an association between food and the green tube, they should go to the tube based on the color cue, even though there aren't any food scents or other cues associated with food. If the fish can't see colors, they should confuse the green tube with the gray tube of corresponding brightness. But the fish don't confuse the tubes. They overwhelmingly orient to the green tube 
That causes von Frisch to infer that fish see colors. Here are the tubes von Frisch used. He had them custom made and says they were rather expensive. The colored paper he has melted into the walls of the tubes comes from a famous color vision laboratory in Germany that sells standardized colors for color vision research. Von Frisch's result, however, squarely contradicted the work of Carl von Hess, a German ophthalmologist who had performed experiments starting in 1909, demonstrating that fish cannot see colors. The two got into a public and well-documented feud over this. Here's a little sketch von Frisch drew of von Hess in a 1912 letter to his mother, where he complained that von Hess had a sharp and egotistical face. Some of Hess's most striking experiments use this T-shaped device that takes in light from different sources here and here. Then it redirects that light in a 90 degree angle into a common direction. Hess prepared his fish by keeping them in a dark room for at least 30 minutes. Then he used the device to shine two different lights in a fish tank. He uses artificial sources of light that allow him to tightly control the brightness and color of the light. He found that the fish swam to the light that was brightest regardless of color. From that result, Hess inferred that fish are colorblind. Some key differences between the approaches. Von Frisch trained his fish over the course of days and allowed them to become acclimated to their new environment. He kept three to four fish in a tank so they weren't too crowded. Hess, working at the Naples Anton Dorn Zoological Research Station, used hundreds of fish every two to three days for weeks so that he had used over a thousand fish by the end of his experiment. He needed all those fish because he was unable to keep them alive in captivity for longer than a day. Hess worked with Mediterranean sand smelt, which are accustomed to brackish water, while von Frisch used common European minnows, which are accustomed to fresh water. Von Frisch used sunlight from a window in his laboratory to light his experiments. Hess used various artificial light sources, and the control that Hess had with those artificial light sources allowed him to quantify his results across an added dimension. Von Frisch and Hess never reconciled their contradictory conclusions. But looking back, we can see that both men were somewhat right. Their contradictory interpretations result from the fact that animals exhibit different capacities in different contexts. Hess's lightbox experiments created an emergency situation where the fish exhibited fleeing type behavior. When fleeing, fish seem to disregard color and swim to the brightest light. Von Frisch, on the other hand, created a more comfortable environment for his fish that allowed them to engage in feeding type behavior. His experiment showed that in the context of feeding behavior, fish can discriminate between colors. The fact that both von Hess and von Frisch were partially right in their feud is gonna come back near the end of this presentation as an important clue to solving the mystery of how von Frisch relates to ethology. The next comparison concerns the question of whether honeybees can recognize colors. Von Frisch applied his gray card technique to this problem in a really similar way as with the fish. It's just that instead of using colored test tubes, he uses little glass bowls placed on a multicolored checkerboard. By filling the bowl on the blue square with sugar water, Von Frisch trains the bees to associate food with the color blue. Then, to perform his experiment, he empties all the bowls and watches where the trained bees go. Just as with the fish, the honeybees orient to the bowl on the blue square causing von Frisch to infer that honeybees can see colors. Contrast von Frisch's gray card approach with the approach of American comparative psychologist, Charles Henry Turner, who also asked whether honeybees could see colors. Some brief background on Turner. He was probably the first African-American to earn a PhD in zoology from the University of Chicago. He was also probably the first African-American to publish in science. However, due to the pervasive racism of American academics, Turner was unable to find per a permanent university position. Contrast that with von Frisch, who was born into the Exner family scientific dynasty. Deborah Cohen has done a lot of great work on this, but for now I'll just say that the Exner family were part of the intellectual aristocracy of Vienna during a period when Vienna was an intellectual center of Europe. Almost all the men in von Frisch's family were professional academics with prestigious positions. Turner ends up teaching biology at a segregated high school in St. Louis, Missouri. A few years before von Frisch performs his gray card experiments on bees, Turner begins his own investigations into whether honeybees can see colors in a field near the high school. He creates cardboard cornucopias of different colors that he uses as feeding stations by placing honey inside. Then he pins them to plants in the field at various heights. 
To describe one version of his experiments, he trains the bees to associate food with the color red by placing honey in the red cornucopias and leaving them out overnight. The honeybees come collect all the honey, and the next morning his red cornucopias are empty. Then in the test situation, he puts the cornucopias out again, but puts no food in any of them. The bees still overwhelmingly orient to the red cornucopias. A few things to note about this experiment. First, Turner's ability to quantify his results. You'll see X's here on the table. The X's mean that the bees were so numerous that it was impossible to make an accurate count. Turner doesn't have assistance helping him count bees like von Frisch does. Furthermore, Turner is working with wild bees whose foraging behavior he cannot structure into discrete experimental trials. In a footnote, he writes, when these experiments were first planned, it was my intention to mark each bee that participated. But at this stage of the work, I realized that such a procedure would be impracticable and my paint and brush were put away. Such a procedure was quite practicable for von Frisch. He used a paint dot notation technique to keep track of his bees. When attracting bees to the table, Von Frisch found that the bees quickly drained his sugar bowl, and if he refilled it every time they drained it, he soon attracted an unmanageable number of bees that he and his assistants could not count. So as bees landed at the feeding site, he put paint dots on their back. He found that by refilling the bowl every 30 minutes, he could attract the same group of roughly 200 foragers. That allowed Von Frisch to structure the honeybees foraging behavior into discrete experimental trials, where each trial involves the same group of a known quantity of bees. As a result, he's able to quantify the outcomes of his experiments in a more reliable way. Second, Von Frisch is using standardized colors designed for color perception research. Using these grayscale cards, he's able to systematically control for the possibility that the bees are discriminating between shades of gray rather than exhibiting true color vision. Turner doesn't have standardized colors. He claims that natural variations in brightness caused by clouds and shadows show that the bees probably possess true color vision. A final difference between the two approaches has to do with the researcher's willingness to make inferences about the mental operations of animals. Here's what Turner concludes in his research report. These experiments prove that to the bee, my colored discs, my colored cornucopias, and my colored boxes were something more than mere sensations. It seems to me that they were true percepts. To the bees, those things had acquired a meaning. Those strange red things had come to mean honey bearers, and those strange green things and strange blue things had come to mean not honey bearers. Contrast that with von Frisch's career-long reluctance to make claims about the subjective states of animals. This quote comes from later on in his career, but it applies just as much to his early work. If I have taken to speaking of the psychology of the bees, I still want to make one thing clear up front. I cannot speak of what goes on in the bee's soul but only of those things which manifest themselves externally. So given these historically relevant comparisons, we can see how exactly von Frisch's gray card experiments reconciled certain holist and reductionist themes. Von Frisch is more reductionist than Turner. He eschews talk of animal subjective experience, has less natural experimental conditions than Turner, and as a result, is better able to quantify his results. But von Frisch is also more holistic than von Hess, who implements more artificial control than von Frisch and is able to quantify his results across, across more dimensions than von Frisch. So by the time Tinbergen and Lorenz begin promoting ethology in the 1930s, von Frisch has already demonstrated one way for researchers to reconcile reductionism and holism in their work. But there's more than this abstract conceptual affinity between von Frisch's work and ethology's goals. There's also concrete relations of influence. As a university student and early career academic, Tinbergen was markedly influenced by von Frisch's experimental style. First, it's important to realize how much of an age difference separates these two figures. In 1926, von Frisch was 40 years old. He had recently replaced his one-time mentor, Richard Hertwig, at the direct, as the director of the Munich Zoological Laboratory, and he had recently co-founded the Journal for Comparative Physiology, a publication that continues to flourish. Tinbergen, on the other hand, was 19 years old. He had recently entered the University of Leiden as an undergraduate zoology major. He was unsure about attending college until his parents sent him to an ornithological research station for the summer after he finished the equivalent of high school. Here he is playing field hockey. During his university days, Tinbergen developed a suspicion that he harbored for the rest of his life, that the subjective experiences of animals are inaccessible to scientific investigation. This stance stood in stark contrast to a tradition of Dutch animal psychology 
a leading member of which was Johannes Behrens de Haan. Tinbergen first made contact with von Frisch's work through von Frisch's research reports. And one can imagine that von Frisch's reluctance to make claims about the subjective experiences of animals endeared Tinberg into von Frisch's work. Remembering his time as an undergrad, Tinbergen writes, I had tremendous admiration, not only for von Frisch's style of research, but also for the way he described it and the civilized way in which he, the younger man, rejected the boorishly expressed criticisms by men more than a generation his seniors, something that at that time in Germany took considerable courage. Here, Tinbergen's referring to the dispute between von Hess over color vision. We can see the influence of von Frisch and Tinbergen's PhD thesis as well, where Tinbergen recreates von Frisch's gray card experiments with digger wasps at his Holhorst field site in the Netherlands. This picture is from after Tinbergen's thesis, but it shows the type of work he did for the thesis. After examining, after earning his PhD, Tinbergen stayed at Leiden University and began training a group of students to perform Frischian style gray card experiments. When Tinbergen publishes his PhD research, he publishes it in von Frisch's journal. And I don't think it's a coincidence that although Tinbergen cites older studies than von Frisch's, only von Frisch's work gains the honorific of being called a classic work. So we're on our way to building a solid case that von Frisch was an exemplar for early ethology. His work had action guiding force for young Tinbergen and the group of students that coalesced around Tinbergen at Leiden University. Presumably, Tinbergen took his Frisian style approach into his collaboration with Lorenz in the 1930s. The problem, however, is that Tinbergen and Lorenz did not always treat von Frisch's work as exemplary. In fact, after Tinbergen links up with Lorenz in 1936 and the two begin promoting ethology, Tinbergen begins referring to von Frisch as an object lesson in what not to do. The traditional home for scientific exemplars is textbooks, where students are shown investigative strategies that they're encouraged to follow. However, ethology lacked texts that were comprehensive and accessible enough to qualify as textbooks prior to World War II. The best candidate for ethology's first textbook is Tinbergen's 1951 book, The Study of Instinct. Tinbergen does refer to von Frisch here. However, instead of referencing von Frisch's work as an example of what ethology is all about, he references von Frisch's work as a cautionary tale of what happens when researchers do not engage in a properly ethological approach to animals. Specifically, he goes over the von Frisch-Hess controversy I examined at the beginning of this presentation. According to Tinbergen, the lesson we should learn from the von Frisch-Hess controversy is that, quote, knowledge of the whole behavior pattern helps us to recognize the relative value of each one of these conclusions and prevents us from describing as incompatible the conclusions drawn from the study of what proved to be two different sorts of behavior. Here, Tinbergen is saying that von Frisch was unable to realize that both he and Hess were right because von Frisch hadn't gained a comprehensive understanding of the animal's behavioral repertoire. Tinbergen referenced the von Frisch-Hess dispute to make the same point while promoting ethology at a US conference in 1938 in a strongly programmatic 1942 paper and in the 1947 inaugural lecture he gave upon assuming the chair of experimental zoology at Leiden University. And the story only gets more complicated from here. After World War II, Tinbergen became the figurehead of ethology, especially in the English speaking world when he moved to Oxford in 1949. His research focus shifted and the image of ethology began to blend with what is currently called behavioral ecology. Although von Frisch never seems to have used the term ethology to describe his own work, he produced a lineage of students who continue to self-identify as neuroethologists. And it's safe to say that this group sees von Frisch as a seminal founding figure for their brand of ethology. This picture is from E.O. Wilson's 1975 book, Sociobiology, where he predicts that the neurophysiological side of ethology would split from the behavioral ecology side. And I use this picture because it acknowledges the division I'm talking about between the brand of ethology that saw von Frisch's work is foundational and Tinbergen's post-World War II style of ethology. There's always more to say, but to add just one more piece to this puzzle, I'll note that in the 1960s, Lorenz looked back to von Frisch's research program, and as he did with many things, attempted to incorporate its success into his own overarching theory of animal behavior research. Specifically, he argued that von Frisch's success supported his gestalt theory of animal observation. 
this is almost certainly an apocryphal reinterpretation of von Frisch's methodology. The important point is that Lorenz saw von Frisch's career as a successful allied endeavor that he could use to support his own theories. So where does this leave von Frisch? What is his relationship to the discipline of ethology? The takeaway from this presentation is that there isn't a simple answer to that question. From a materialist perspective, scientific disciplines are groups of people who share certain investigative habits. Von Frisch meant different things at different times to different people who comprise the discipline of ethology. Von Frisch was an exemplary influence for young Tinbergen in the 1920s and early 30s. Then he was a cautionary tale that Tinbergen used to highlight ethology's unique contribution to animal behavior research. Von Frisch came to be regarded as a founding figure to a German-speaking tradition of neuroethologists. And in the 1960s, Von Frisch represented an opportunity for Lorenz to bolster his own ideas. In the end, this historical philosophical riddle of how Von Frisch fits into ethology demonstrates the multifaceted and indirect ways that individuals can relate to scientific disciplines. Thank you for watching. Here are my sources.